Hello, and welcome to Repertory Screenings, Episode 4. I'm your host, M, and with me are my two co-hosts, Jackson. Hello. And Destiny. Ahoy, hoy. And uh, we're here to talk about movies. Yeah. Did anyone watch any movies? We don't actually do this as a feature of this podcast. Maybe mm-hmm. we should start. Did anyone watch anything they want to talk about? I watched some things. I don't really want to talk about them. I watched a thing I'll talk that's, about. That's so unhelpful, Jackson. What did you watch? <laughs> Why don't you want to talk about it? Because I don't want to be like, hey guys, you had a speed racer. It's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I hope everyone listening to this has seen Speed Racer and enjoys it. I feel like we live in the social circles where that's true. Uh, if you haven't, you should. It's good. Speed Racer has reached the point of, like, when I see dudes doing the, like, I'm a con- cool genius because I like Speed Racer posts, I roll my eyes now. Yes. Um, but I'm glad that that has happened because it's reached the point where everyone's just seen it and knows it's good. Yeah. Now we need to get them all to watch Redline. Yep. Finally. <laughs> Justice can be served. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Destiny, what did you watch? I watched a 15-minute short film called Anima. It is a Tom York album that came out like on the 27th of June, two days ago from this recording, uh, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, I watched this with you. It was good. It was good. Uh, I always forget Tom York does like kind of chill electronic music, and I'm like, oh right, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's pretty good. It's a very uh, sweet little movie. It's just like a dystopian romance type thing. Mm-hmm. Very classic tale. <laughs> uh, did I watch a movie in the last week? I don't think I've watched a movie since we recorded, other than this. So that's on me. Bad at movies. Yeah, bad at movies. Didn't I want to watch a Battle Angel Lita, which is the new Speed Racer. Or sorry, Alita Battle Angel, which is you the new say. Speed Racer. Did you talk uh, about watching Chud? Um, on a different I think, podcast. I think that ended up oh. on a VoIP life, which oh is not helpful gosh. at all to anyone listening to this. Yeah. Uh, but Too we do have podcasts. a premium podcast on the Patreon if you're so interested, <laughs> and where I talk a little bit about Chud. <laughs> if you want Chud content, we look that behind the paywall, because we're really good at doing like marketing and It's not even and like a deep conversation I just talk about for about five minutes out of the weird scene where the like super buff uh, cop who's following the paranoid uh, reporter eats the quarter uh, that he takes out of the payphone when he tries to call someone and tell them about the situation. What the fuck? And it's fucking weird. Chud. Chud's, Chud's really good. good. You should uh, you should uh, watch Chud. That's my advice to everyone. It's like they live. Uh, it's not as like oh, camp as they live, but it definitely exists in the same mode. Um, yeah. Uh, this I, I suppose I should have covered this already. This episode's a week late. My apologies to everyone involved who listens and is on this podcast. I'm the one who pushed <laughs> it back a week. Um, and uh, we're not breaking our normal release schedule. The next episode will be out in a week. We'll talk about what movie that is at the end of this podcast after yes, we, we do questions and everything. So we should probably just get into the movie. Um, the movie we're watching this week is Daughters of the Dust, which is a 1991 film uh, written, directed, and produced by Julie Dash. Uh, it is the first feature film directed by uh, African-American woman distributed theatrically in the United States, according to Wikipedia. Um, this is set in 1902 and is about uh, three generations of the Peasant family uh, who are Gola people living uh, on Ebo Landing, which is uh, off the Georgia coast. And most of the family is about to move north uh, into modernity, and they are prepping for this journey and the tensions that uh, arise, uh, mostly centered around uh, the matriarch of the family, um, who is uh, Nana Pizant, uh played by Coralie Day. And this is narrated by the unborn child of uh, Eula, who is a woman uh, who is part of the family, who's was raped by a white man and no one knows if her husband is the father or this man's the father. And this girl is narrating, like being the torchbearer of this legacy of this family. Um, that's kind of the setup. Yep. Destiny, you picked this movie. You've already, you've saw it before, right? Yeah. I watched it earlier this year. Uh, 
Oh, right. Uh, one, I guess, fact about this movie. Um, it kind of languished in obscurity for some time uh, until uh, Beyonce actually brought this to the forefront by featuring a lot of uh, iconography from the movie in uh, the Lemonade visual album, which is also a good movie people should watch. Yeah. If you haven't seen Lemonade, you should stop this and watch it really quick. <laughs> um <laughs> But because of that, uh, the movie got like a restoration and well, actually the restoration happened before that, but was like not widely seen because it's so the 20th anniversary. And then because of Lemonade, it got like a full theatrical re-release and is now available on, we watched this on Netflix, right? Yeah, it's on Netflix. Yes. Um, and that's great. So, uh, you picked this, uh, do you want to talk about, uh, why you picked it for us and what you think of it? I picked this because, it is one of those films that's considered, like, it, it's one of the most important films in the African-American aesthetic canon. And just, you know, in general, like, uh, and it had bothered me that I hadn't yet seen it. So, um, and then upon seeing it, I, you know, there's so much going on, you really have to watch it twice, but. Yeah, I just thought, why not? This is a very unique, like, look into a culture that not a lot of people know about, even in the U.S., and it's a, it's a really just pretty film. Uh, alright, um, who wants to lead off talking about the movie? Jackson, do you want to do this? I guess I am. I guess I'm up. All right. okay, I could go if you'd rather not. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't, know, I don't want to know where we want to start. I really liked it. Um, uh, I thought it was a good, uh, a really good time. And so, like, so I was expect. I didn't. I didn't realize when I watched it that this was literally the first theatrically released movie by. Um, uh, is it by an African American woman in the United yes. States? Is that is that yes. the criteria? Yes. That's. Yeah. Fu- 1991 <laughs> yeah it's yeah. really upsetting <laughs> like like not even like i would understand rarity marginalized you know film industry and everything but the first in 1991 jesus yeah we're, uh we have yeah, a lot of there problems. were a lot of like early black directors in america but they were all men yes um so yeah that was uh that was surprising somehow surprising even though i guess it's not really surprising right but uh mm-hmm. uh and then yeah, i really like i really like the movie um it, you just kind of get into a uh like a trance watching it because it's it, the way it kind of moved from scene to scene uh is very soft uh and dreamlike and it's like it kind of flows between different points in time in a way where it doesn't really matter when they take when these conversations take place it's all like the memory of this weekend um it's i feel like it does it doesn't like uh, it doesn't want you to solve it as like a timeline thing, right? It just kind of moves between uh, conversations and events happening on the island, um, and you get a sense of everyone's like positions and why they're there and what they're going to do in the future. Uh, and I, I just felt like it was really good at that, um, and I was, I was very glad, very glad to have seen it. Uh, the thing that surprised me because I checked out the Wikipedia page on this movie before, uh, cause Destiny's talked about it and, uh, you know, try to know about things even though I haven't seen them is I feel like the language around this film oversells like the non-linearity of the whole thing. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. because it's always like, oh, this is a whole lot of order and it's very subjective and like the, all of those things are technically true, but because it is, a, just like a melodrama about people's feelings you don't need it to be directly in like a plot paced a to b to c line to understand the whole of the thing Mm -hmm. i feel like uh non-linearity is often used to describe inscrutability and i don't think there's much that's inscrutable about this like this is a family drama much the way that all family dramas are shot and filmed and that's part of the appeal is this is a very specific and unique family situation described with the language that we all know from just watching people's lives and emotions in cinema right 
like half a film is a bunch of people from slightly different cultural situations come for dinner. Like that's yes. like an entire <laughs> this is an entire swath of cinema, uh, and this is just one of those. And yeah, so I also was like reacting to that in the sense of like I realized that things like oh maybe this wasn't happening in order while watching it, but I didn't pick up on that as being like a super key detail. And then I read this and it was like oh the nonlinearity is a super innovative part. And I'm like it is, but like I I like that it isn't you know it's not about how what I'm never thinking did this happen before this because none. Of it, none of it matters. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a formalist exercise yes. in that way that you would yes. think from the descriptions. Uh, but, absolutely, because you know, playing this because like I, ca- I came in expecting like like a memento and right, the, but the color <laughs> purple, and it's not that. Not even close. Yeah, no, I think also, but there's something to be said for non linearity being sort of it 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 kind of. Through that, like, sort of not giving too much away about certain relationships and the link between past, present, and future is a very important concept in, I think, like, traditional African religion. Mm -hmm. And, And I think there's something to be said for that and how it presents in the film. But uh, I, that's fair. I agree that, you know, it's it's not that hard to follow. I just I, I will say there I think it has its inscrutable moments and I think it's intentional. I just I read the nonlinearity much more you than like I would read it in like a novel than how I think of that when it's usually exercised in cinema as like a because cinema often turns into like a puzzle uh like formally to parse and i don't think this movie is like about that no like you're not teasing apart the structure of the film to get at some truth that is hidden like the truths are just in the people and they will tell you about them uh because it's about these people sharing their feelings about stuff well like one of my favorite characters in this film is the great grandmother of all of everyone there mama Pizant. i can't think of her name it's just Nana Pazant. Nana Pazant? Okay. Thank you. And she's like the connection between the past and the future. And one of the characters in the very beginning is saying that, like, you know, we thought you would protect us from all the bad things that have happened, all the lynchings and all of the, you know, uh, post-slavery suffering that we've gone through. And, you're, you know, you're ties to the old religion and hoodoo magic you know they they aren't actually protecting us and this is why we need to leave for this new part of like leave for this new chapter of our lives to begin she's the one that connects them to who they were Mm mm-hmm um, I liked how much of the movie uh, was like focused specifically on Christianity as this like weird comical like in- intrusion uh, on people's like culture and lives. Like th- when because the one of the I f- forget which uh, which um which the specific name who who's the one who is um who's already already uh, come from the uh, who's like already migrated. And it's like coming back and bringing everyone, like, I've got to teach you all about God. And it's so ridiculous. Uh, that's Viola. Yeah, that's Viola. Viola. Yeah. She's a missionary, um, I think. Yeah, she's fully bought in. Um, and uh, I liked all the stuff with her coming back and the way that she starts off as, like, kind of like a comic figure being so ridiculously bought into these ludicrous ideas of like christianity and coming back uh home here and the way that just like slowly breaks is very good uh and like through the confrontations in the middle of the movie um she also comes with mr sneed who is just uh, the most ridiculous cartoon man uh, <laughs> well, just for like, what he's called a, like mr sneed yes he's just like uh, like a city dandy who comes in with his photography to take pictures of everyone and uh tell them about how good it is when you move to uh, quote unquote civilization right yep yeah there's a um, lot of that that's the big divide between these two groups of people the mainlander the pro mainlanders <laughs> who want to believe in jesus because the old ways aren't protecting them 
Uh, yeah, the thing uh, about the Christianity that I like is that we're presented with a situation that is like three faiths all interacting. There is yeah. like the traditional faith, uh, like the like what would you call it? Is, is it just hoodoo destiny? You know, well, I'd call it folk magic because like folk magic. Okay, yeah. Uh, that Nana Pazant, uh has, and then there is the Christianity, which is like implanted culturally on people, you know, as Africans came over and were indoctrinated to Christianity or adopted it through like slavery. And then there is like two Muslim characters uh, who practice and are kind of like separated from both of them through the like difference in like written language and belief systems of both like both uh Nana Pazant, who doesn't have time for all of these like book religions and the Christians who don't like anyone who isn't Christian look down I feel like a little bit on the uh or look separately on the uh Islamic people there mm -hmm. uh yeah absolutely um I don't, know, I don't have really have a good follow up on that, other than I do like how that all all that stuff uh, plays in the film. Like I really like the um, uh, early scene uh, with Nana Pazan and um, uh, Eli, where Eli's having a whole normal one about uh, his kid, <laughs> and Nana Pazan's trying to like remind him that one like. Uh, the thing that happened to his wife, like, because uh, his wife was uh, was raped and his child couldn't might not be his, and he's treating that as like a property dispute, and yes. Nana Pazant's trying to be like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" Yeah, uh, and she does this by like trying to remind him of the like connection between people and the way, like, she's like, "I'm gonna be dead soon, but like, we'll all be dead soon. We all have this connection between us. It all like goes back uh, to the ancestors." Uh, and she's like trying to remind him of, of her religion and like what connects them and their culture, and while he's having a, just a really bad time. Um, and that well, stuff was good. Yeah. Uh, also, like the ways in which he treats it are not like they are like toxic masculinity, like protective yes. of the women stuff. But it's also like the, the like idea that he, like this is his kid and his woman is like tied up in all of the like. Yes, tensions of these people are like mo like half this family lived through the end of slavery or lived mm -hmm. it in slavery. Like Nana Pazant has indigo stains from when she worked on plantations doing indigo dye for like cotton. Um, and the idea that uh, like her kid runs around now and talks about how he owns his wife and his child right. is uh, like she scolds him not just because it's a shitty thing to say, but because it is like the thinking of like the oppression they've gone through right yes oh definitely uh and the ways in which she reminds everyone that they are a legacy of like uh not just the family living through this but like the a uh, people who have lived through centuries of slavery and still preserve their culture through all of it and how important it was to rem remember that they had survived this like as successfully as possible with their sense of self intact uh, mm -hmm. is good. Nana Pazant is a hero. <laughs> yeah, Nana Pazant is clearly the hero of this movie. Uh, and like all the stuff, and, like the, the main thrust of her argument is one about like a cultural memory and not like forgetting uh, this entire history purely in a quest uh, for integration, which is like short sighted as, I, like, I assume the audience watching it is meant to think of this as short-sighted, given that we have now, we have sat through the 20th century and know how a lot of this stuff goes. Uh, yeah. I, um, yeah. I it mean, does not go I, very well. I, like, yes, but also, I think, I don't think that the movie's like, these people are making yes. the wrong choice. Like, no, true. Making a choice yeah, no. that is... Uh, like Gullah people still exist. Uh, they are like a small minority as they always, as they were even back then, but they're like, they are still around. And, but that like in part of being like any very limited culture like that is that it's not going to grow. And for certain people, there's like an impossibility of thriving in that. Mm -hmm. Um, like, uh, we haven't mentioned, uh, Yellow Mary, who is uh, one of Nana's granddaughters who like went to the city, uh, under, 
nebulous circumstances, but came back with her girlfriend and you're like, okay, I understand how this happened. Um, <laughs> and like, there's no place for this in the traditional like life on Evo landing. Uh, not that Nana Pazant is particularly judgmental of her or anything, but just like, you know, mm-hmm. Viola is there with her like Bible thumping and it, like hates yellow mary um hagar who's like the woman who's like organizing this move north uh just hates it because of the embarrassment of not being like proper um and uh so like there are things that can't be had when you live in like the woods on an island in 1902 right Yes. There's just ways of life that are incompatible with that. That it's. I think it's the movie does not judge the people for wanting to go do no. those things. I, uh, but but I it, mean, like, there's a lot of movies, like a lot of stories that would frame, you know, the coming of civilization as a good thing. But still, today people do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is much more about what it means to negotiate your place uh, in the world, right? Like, this is a, a whole generation. Like the generational difference in this movie between the people who li- actually lived through slavery and the people who haven't is like the whole like one of the central themes and people trying to figure out how do we find our place uh in this current structure uh mm-hmm. some people have bought in all the way some people have like uh you know uh tried their best to hold on to the past and some people are trying their like to navigate their own uh solutions um because i i definitely think the uh like that episode's a hero but yellow mary's also a hero <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, just unquestionably because <laughs> that first scene when um uh, Viola and Sneed, <laughs> he's called Sneed, are just ludicrously talking about how important the the things that they have uh, discovered by going to civilization and religion are. And then Yellow Mary just sitting there on the side with her girlfriend, like, yeah, whatever you say, mate. <laughs> and it's incredible. <laughs> you know, I I did not feel like the movie was mocking Christianity as much as you. I I really didn't get that. <laughs> um. I I don't know. That's just how I came away with that. Mm. Uh. Uh, I would say that it like depicts it as like a a frictive space, right? Like yeah. people, the people who get God often will like treat their family members badly because they don't agree in the same way. Like th- like certain types of like fervently held uh evangelical christianity just like kind of make you shitty to the people around you sometimes right Mm -hmm. uh because Mm -hmm. you hold your beliefs over the like relationship with people and the ways in which that is contrasted with nana pazan's like even the people who think that she's like a ridiculous old woman she is going to extend a hand to uh because uh they're her family and that's more important than like the rules of the belief system that they carry with them right Mm -hmm. that's very true Yeah, I would agree with that with its uh, Christianity stuff. I don't, I think, I don't think that's like the, I don't think the movie's like, yeah, we're gonna dunk Christianity as like the central theme of it. I just like latched onto that as one of the first discussion points because um, <laughs> I think it's like one of the, oh, it's definitely one of the things it opens with, uh, with those two on the river. Uh, one of the other uh, side plots that doesn't particularly matter but is amazing every time it shows up is the uh, romance between Iona and yeah. Saint Julian Last Child. Yeah, oh, it's amazing. That music plays. So, uh, did, did everyone else like cheer when she runs off the boat? Yes, you know yeah, it. Good. Yeah, good. yeah. yeah. Uh, so Julian Lastchild's like a native who lives on this island with everyone, kind of as separate, and is just like this rugged, beautiful man who like sits in trees and remembers <laughs> his version of what it is to like live in this land. Uh, it is exactly the kind of not like it's not meant to be a trope, but because it's the early '90s, it, it's a thing that kind of I feel like became a trope. So it, it yeah. feels very oversized compared to a lot of the characters in this movie. Uh, just this rugged native who's going to ride it on the horse and be the romantic figure uh, for Iona, uh, which is uh, interesting. In that, I bet this trope also just existed in the '80s, um, but because it's not like this white woman falling for this like man yeah. of the wild, mm-hmm. and is instead just someone who also lived here and had this legacy of this land is theirs but also is complicated because of like you know 
the people who live here were brought here on ships, on slave ships, and now they live here. And that's there's always going to be that trauma in their relationship with this area. Um, I feel like levels the power dynamic and makes it more interesting. Um, mm. But I also, agree. it's played as it's literally played as like a like romance novel every time he shows up with the swell of music and the wind <laughs> blowing in his hair. And like the fact that it is the early nineties and the the, the slow mo shots with the synth soundtrack. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, like this stuff is where that smells the most, and it's just ridiculous. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, it's very good. It's it's really just like a C plot, but I enjoy it so much. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's it's so sweet. It pays off. Uh, what else do we want to talk about in this about the movie? All the shots of food forever. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Uh, I like the stuff with the unborn child. There's like moments because it's not just her voiceover; she also shows up at moments. Oh yeah, um, she's mm-hmm. showing up in photos, touching people's shirts. Yeah, there's one particular shot where I think she's just walking up like behind her mother, um, and in like because I feel like she's used in this in this in a way of like um, Nana Pazan keeps reminding you this is you know this is, this is a long legacy going backwards but she exists right to right this is also a long legacy going forwards and this uh, whatever this event is isn't isn't like the end of a culture or anything this isn't actually the big turning point of uh um like this migration isn't like doesn't have to define uh everything for the next however many years that there, there will always be uh a next generation right like um and I like that she basically is there to remind people of that, that uh, the time keeps moving and there's still more history. Um, and that, that shot where she like shows up to give her uh, her mother like more strength was very good when her mother's like really anxious about everything. Uh, and then uh, she kind of just like appears behind her. Uh, it was very good. Mm-hmm. There is the scene where she literally runs into her mother's body, which is yep. uh, good. Good, nice digital effect. Uh, I love <laughs> the cinema of the early 90s. Not until Twin Peaks would we get such uh, good <laughs> cinema again. And I mean that legitimately earnestly. It's good. I know. I like it a lot. Sometimes something can just be like a kind of dodgy video effect, and it's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, the thing, one of the things I really liked is you get the history of Ebo Landing, which is like an actual place yes. in the world because this is this is big, like partially based on julie dash's like ancestry i think it's like semi-autobiographical um mm-hmm. and anyway um the island itself has like a history around it because it's where a slave ship uh landed and everyone all the slaves aboard uh like resisted by jumping into the ocean with their chains and drowned themselves in like a mass suicide um Wikipedia tells me it happened in 1803. So like uh, almost a hundred years after uh, or before this movie takes place and the ways in which they talk about that, like they are proud of this place, but uh, like the legend of them, like walking across the water back to the mainland versus like what actually happened is a thing that people talk about. Like they will proudly tell the story of everyone walking across the water back to Africa, but like, it's it, ma- it makes it feel like the older people know the actual story. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the guys that Mr. Sneed visits was like there when it, he, he claims he was there when it happened, which doesn't line up, but you know, whatever. Um, and uh, tells him the story is like this, the actual legacy is not that we survived this and like went on to like our great victory. It's that we all drowned and that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, and that sucks. And, I think it's interesting the movie grapples with this like sense of fatalism about mm-hmm. their situation because uh, I think it doesn't really buy into it very much, but it, it, you you have to acknowledge that the, the situation can and will be troublesome, right? Yes. Like people with this long legacy uh, struggle with what that means, um, even when they generally believe that it is like a thing to be cherished and carried forward as a source of strength. Like then they like that strength is tacked on to a lot of suffering. Um, and even Nana if like when she's talking to Eli, like brings up the, the things that they went through, uh, and how much it sucks that he is being a petulant child. Uh, when, he is still like a free man who has a wife and a coming child. And that's a good thing. And he has a whole family and here he is worried about some dumb shit that doesn't matter. Um, (laughs) 
And she did not raise him to be someone who would stand in the graveyard uh, where his like father and his father's father are and act like a fool. Yeah, that scene's incredible. Yeah, yes. I, I keep coming back to it because it's just so amazing. Uh, yeah, no, for, and like, there's a lot of attention paid to like the way uh, people will like try to narrativize this like legacy of trauma, right? Like, people are trying to make sense of this like horrible thing that happened and work out what to do now, um, and it definitely like gives all the characters the space to like deal with that themselves some people prefer to think about uh like to turn things into like yes no we walked back and this legend is meaningful because it like tells us something about uh our lives and some people prefer to like be more fatalist about it uh and it gives each character the the space to process this because it's just massive unthinkable amounts of uh cultural trauma um and the way it uh portrays that in each person is very good i think um because it definitely doesn't like try to moralize like this is the right way to deal with uh this um e- like even at the end when certain people are deciding to leave and certain people are deciding to stay like everyone is equally like valid in their choices that it's just what happened it's not like commented on as um i mean the only one that's commented on as the real victory is <laughs> her and uh iona running after her lover <laughs> but aside from that every every other one is just this is just the choices people made and I like that. Uh. Me too. Mm-hmm. For a movie that it has, you know, this uh, shared collective thoughts uh, towards trauma or about trauma for a film about those things, it also just makes you feel good to be black. <laughs> like, everything is just beautiful and connected. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> That's wow. fair. Cannot uh, cannot comment on what it feels like to be black, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> that is for you me alone. Yep. Just me. But yeah, it the, the the movie is very affirming in ways that uh, we don't have enough time for me to really get into. <laughs> I mean, you can speak a little bit to them if you want. I mean, a lot of time. Some of it's obvious. Just like. The fact that you see black women with all different kinds of faces and hairstyles and presentations of femininity. Uh, and then you get to see the same thing on, like, the masculine side. And I don't know, just... There's also the... Um, like I mentioned, the connection to the ancestors, it it affirms and validates just, like, a lot of the choices we all had to make uh, over the, you know, eons of (laughs) being, or not eons, but you know what I mean, like, just being free this whole time and having to still... (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a hard time expressing it, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing that I think is interesting about that is that, like, if this movie firmly puts most of these feelings into the women, and the, there's a scene literally where the men sit around and they're like, uh, it's great that the women know all this stuff, but we mostly just want to think about how nice the women are and how good life is because <laughs> we have women with us. Uh it is uh, extremely like '90s feminism about it, but I don't think it's like that wrong. <laughs> uh, reeks of gender, but in like a good way. Yeah, no, there's a lot of gender. Like I, that's why I was struggling because I'm like, oh no, I'm getting too deep in the w- w- uh, woods about gender. But I, I think I don't know. That's something that's important. And then also like, it still validates, you know, not giving it like buying into the binary and bu- buying into a heteronormative life like yellow mary is happy even though she's ruined in their words mhm and she does she stays right yeah she stays and her uh girlfriend leaves with the family yeah mhm 
I love Yana Mary, especially as like her stuff compared to the way um like uh all those scenes with Eli that we we're talking about uh is very because I, I agree that it definitely shows like the idea of um like this is how heterosexuality has to be as definitely as a construct of uh you know western society being bad like all of his anxieties about oh what about what has this 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 other person done to my wife that i own um and i I feel like that definitely connects to yellow mary like not having any of that like her relationships have their own troubles but it doesn't come with any of that baggage specifically Mm -hmm. um it's just about tensions between people in a way that is very different so i i I, am I, I agree that it's definitely doing that on purpose. Yeah, uh, Eli is, like, into this, like, rigid defining of, like, what a family unit is. And it's him yes. and his wife and his unborn child. Or, like, what his goal is, which is to provide, provide for his family by going north. Uh, even though he has people, like, around him who are like, stay, we can work on... Like, one of the guys that he talks to, uh, one of the Muslim guys talks about, like, stay and we can work on, like, anti-lynching uh, legislation and movements in this area. Uh, because that's, a like, a thing that's boiling on the background. And he's like, no, I've got to do the right thing and take my family up north and um stays with eula when she decides to stay here on the island and raise her child here but uh yellow mary in like in contrast is about like this expansion and fuzzing of what the definition of like our people and our way of life mm-hmm. is like the family can be whatever you want to define it as as long as you are like strong enough to open your heart to it like she brings trula to this huge family meeting with a bunch of people that she knows doesn't like her because it's part of her reality and trula is important to her um and it never becomes like a frictive point where trula is like you shouldn't have brought me or anything like that stuff never comes up because this is just what yellow mary is going to do and in many ways, it's like the like the modern idea of the things that Nana Pazant preaches, right? Like she's the yes. one who carries on Nana's legacy uh, more than any other character. It just does it in a much more like like someone who's gone to the city and wears a beautiful dress and is like a lesbian who talks about going to uh, town and looking at nice things that Nana Pazant would never have time for. Like those things, the belief system can still exist in modernity, yeah, uh, yes. through like redefined. Definitely. Yeah, and the way that uh, Yellow Mary and the 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 movie presents um, a sense of being able to construct that for yourself, right, is very like good. Um, mm-hmm. uh, especially as compared to like the way, because I remember the big the, the big confrontation scene uh, with Nana Pizana, and then like when um, Vi- Viola like. Uh, Viola like, has like a breakdown when Nana's like, "I'll just be dead. I won't be able to remember you because I'll be dead." And then like Viola's like, "You can't say that here because it's like completely." Like, she doesn't have the ability to um, allow her belief system to be anything other than the most rigid. Now that she's bought into it, mm-hmm. uh, whereas I like Nana not being able to uh, not Nana, not Yellow Mary being able to um, adapt is definitely shown as like uh, something worthwhile to aspire to. Um, Do you have anything? Anyone got anyone else? Has anything got anyone else to say for the movie? No, I think I've, I'm just getting repetitive. Mm-hmm, same. Uh, all right. Well, then I guess we'll just move on to questions. If you have questions, you can send them to podcast at abnormalmapping dot com. Uh, we'll take them on anything, not just the movies we're talking about. Uh, we have one question today. Uh, well, a set of questions, uh, by Tron, who once again yeah! sent us a bunch of questions. Thank you, Tron. <laughs> Thank um, you, Tron. And I'll read down the ones I think we haven't covered. Um, specifically, what do you think of the unborn child as a storytelling device is the first question. Um, I think the framework, it's weird because I think it's like the hokiest part of the movie, but I think it works. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like it's like right on the razor's edge of being a little too cheesy for me. Um, that's fair. Uh, I like it. I, I mean, I like when this movie leads into being cheesy because I like the Umbel Chan stuff and I like uh, her running off the boat as the music plays. Uh, like, th- it definitely goes for those indulgent moments. 
The, but, the thing, the thing that the Umber Child reminds me of most is the theatrical version of Blade Runner, where <laughs> the Unborn Child just comes in with narration to tell you a thing you were already feeling, but making sure that you absolutely know what you should yes. be feeling here. <laughs> I'm going to tell you exactly what you're meant to be taking away from this scene. I have to say, uh, the actress who plays or voices the Unborn Child way better than Harrison Ford at delivering. The <laughs> <laughs> um. The next question is, what do you think of the music in this movie? The end credits song reminded me this movie was made in the early 90s. <laughs> the song is didn't hilarious. It, didn't it take you right to the 90s? God. Uh, yes. Yeah, the music is the only thing that dates this movie truly for me. It dates it so hard, though. They're all <laughs> dating itself. Listen to those synths. Um, and then, what do you think of the subtitles that appeared in the movie early on? Uh, the first time that you're introduced to Nana Pazant, her narration is subtitled, but not for most of the rest of it, uh, which confused me because I assumed, that, because you're not showing her during that narration, I assumed there would be another older character that shows up that speaks like a deeper like Gola Creole uh, that would have be had subtitled the entire time, but that's just not the case. I I assume that was just like to introduce any viewers who weren't familiar to like the you know mm-hmm. the yeah. to realize, yeah. hey, this these you can understand this, and so it's gonna be like put at the start rather than because because that way I, th- I think my assumption of the intention is you can line up what she's saying and stop being like i can understand this and then after the first like scene that goes away and then you realize i can just understand this yeah yes. this isn't this isn't inscrutable yeah extremely should attack the block have subtitles <laughs> like come on <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing that i think is interesting we me and destiny both watch movies subtitled destiny prefers having subtitles on so the general subtitles on netflix like translate the words into like quote unquote like proper the like i guess grammar is like, like american english corrected yeah yeah which is really weird as a choice i don't hate it but it it does i feel like the choice is made probably like if we just like do like the mark twain direct translation of dialogue people will be very exhausted by it and i understand that but i feel like it overcorrected into just like removing a lot of the like character it's really weird as a choice yeah it is very strange um let's see uh ba-ba. Uh, uh, Tron asked specifically, what do you think about the Cherokee character in this movie? Uh, I wish he had, like, actual more to do other than the speech he gave about, like, my people also have names for all this land and gives, like, the names of all these islands and stuff as he sits in a tree in, like, the biggest pullback shot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, he is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of that stuff, but it, like, he's absolutely given the, like, least specificity of any of the characters. Mm hmm. Uh, and then Tron's last question here uh, was, what was the most interesting thing about Gullah culture you learned from this movie? I, You know, the interesting thing is, I don't, like, this is, like, specifically about a Gullah family, but I think the movie itself goes out of its way to universalize a lot of the experience mm-hmm. um, to the point where, like, I personally didn't find it. Uh, I mean, I don't know. This is complicated by, like, my relationship with Destiny, who... Uh, you know, is a black culture. St- <laughs> yes, you're, you're, you're a black woman who practices your own type of folk magic, right? Like, there's stuff in here about the stuff that Nana Fazant does with like, like the bag that she gives people with like her hair in it. That I'm like, oh right, Destiny does this stuff. <laughs> um, so it's it's weird when when people say the word Gola, the thing I actually think of is the '90s television show Gola Gola Island. <laughs> yes, I also think of that. Which is uh, about this family who lives on an island with a big, like, cartoon frog in, like, a mascot suit uh, that is sometimes animated and sometimes just the suit. And they just go on adventures in very 90s for very small children television shows. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yep. Which I think was more about, like, teaching you, like, Creole words and culture than this movie definitely is. Which is fine. Like, you know, movies do not have to be education suites. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think this was educational, really. Like, um, I, I, like it's, I'm less familiar uh, just with the context by being, you know, a white British person. <laughs> Um, but I, I, it wasn't like, oh, yeah. Now I feel like I understand the these these people because it's not it's not going for that, um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, I I just feel like it's very good at telling the story of like these specific individuals. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so that's it for questions. Uh, next month. All right, not next month. This is not a monthly podcast, and also this <laughs> will be out next week. Next week, we are watching Throne of Blood, which is Kurosawa's adaptation of Macbeth, uh, which I'm very excited for. Wanted to do a Kurosawa, and where can people find this streaming? Jackson, do you have the UK streaming stuff? Yeah, in the UK, you can find the streaming on uh, like Amazon and iTunes and everything to buy. I think it is also on the BFI player for free. Um, okay. So if you've got the is that BFI, thing you have to like uh, subscribe to, or is it just there? I don't, I don't know anything about the BFI. I don't know. I don't. Okay. Uh, yes, you have to subscribe for that. Let's. It is a fourteen day free trial, and then four ninety nine a month. So if you want to get the uh, free trial, you can watch Brown about that way. It's also on Amazon um, and iTunes for uh, four ninety nine um, or two forty nine to rent. Uh, and you could also theoretically VPN and steal the Criterion Collection subscription for someone in America. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Destiny, where can you find this in America? Uh, I didn't have the website up, so just a second. Well, it's on the Criterion Collection in America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you uh, have a Criterion account, you can stream it that way. I assume it's also on Thank iTunes you, to buy in America and everything. Yeah, I assume it's available to rent normally, but yes, it's on yes, the Criterion, uh, Criterion work thing. So. Yeah. As is as is most of Kurosawa's body of work, honestly. <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited, God. Yeah, this will be a treat. Uh, so that's it. Jackson, do you want to tell people where they can find us? You can find us on the oh, internet. You know, actually, let me no. interrupt you for just a second. So okay. we host a couple shows that we do not do on Abnormal Mapping. Uh, and we have a other movie podcast that uh, is called Seasons, A Year of Movies, uh, with our friends Emma and Grace. And they just started a Miyazaki uh series that they're going to do uh they, they started with castle of cagliostro um and are going forward through all of miyazaki's films uh so please check that out we don't really cover anime here because we do it everywhere else <laughs> um uh, i don't have plans to like cover miyazaki because uh you know everyone most people have seen it um but have they? uh it's a good podcast uh if you just go to abnormalmapping.com it'll be there in the list of shows uh it's at like albumromapping.com slash seasons movie pod. Um, and I, I like it. Uh, it's a much chiller because they're just a, a couple who just talk through movies. Uh, this is a little more formal than that, obviously, but it's good. Yep. Cool. You can find me at Headfuls Off on the Twitter. You can find other podcasts, including that one and including other ones we do at Um There's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Do you want to list them? Yeah, we got Abnormal Mapping, which is a video game podcast. You can shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got um, an old Star Trek podcast that we're done with for now, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, we have Gundam. That's you. You. I'm trying to think. I think this, this is the other one. Fuck we you. have a new feed that went up recently that people can go look at. Yes, that's it. That's what I was being pointed towards. <laughs> <laughs> we have a new feed that you, people can look at if you want to. Uh, it's called Your Uncle's Beach House. It's a podcast we've been doing for a while, uh, but it goes up on our Patreon feed, which is where most of our anime content goes up. But this is the free stuff that uh, isn't Gundam. So if you don't subscribe to Gundam but do want to subscribe to our anime podcast without having to uh, pay for the Patreon RSS, uh, then it, the free content will go there. And it's uh, you every couple months. Usually, it's not. It's not a regular podcast, but that's that's the feed. There's a whole bunch. We've been we've been doing about one a month, actually. But yeah, but I don't want to promise that. Right yeah, now, we're not promising yes. one a month. We just it's been about one. We've done like ten in the last year. Or so yeah, and we have it, another one coming up in July. So please look forward to that. It waxes and wanes. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, we're also a Patreon supported podcast. If you go to patreon.com slash normal mapping, uh, you can pledge to support the network and all the shows we do keep roofs over our heads and our bellies full and our streaming services on because, uh, <laughs> Lord knows we need it. Um, Netflix just keeps getting more expensive and the content just keeps getting worse. So I don't understand yeah, how this is possible. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> Did they raise their prices uh, again? Uh, like a month ago. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Netflix is just like that. Um, for your pledge, at $1, you get the Great Gundam Project. That is the one that, you know, most people subscribe to. Uh, it is our weekly Gundam podcast. We watch two episodes of Gundam, two episodes of another show if we're watching a series. Right now, it is Macross, the 80s show, which is exceptional. Uh, if you've never watched anime before, watch Macross. <laughs> it'll, <laughs> it'll blow your mind, I swear to God. <laughs> yeah, um, really well. 
Um, you can find me on Twitter at em underscore being. Uh, you can find Destiny at Fridge Buzz now. Uh, yes. Is that all you have to plug, Destiny? Yes, I have nothing else to plug. Okay. Um, and if you want to hang out and talk about movies, you can go to our Discord. Uh, the link to that is on the website, abnormalmapping.com. We'll be back next week, because uh, thankfully next week is a long vacation for us in America. Uh, me and Destiny both have long weekends, so we're going to just go right into the next movie. Very excited. Uh, so come back for Throne of Blood. 